So I'm going to turn with us tonight to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. And uh, God going hot off the press. I just, God began dealing with my heart this afternoon, gave me a thought several weeks ago. Uh, but uh, stirred it back up in my spirit this afternoon and uh, finished up the notes just before I walked through the door tonight. But uh, we want to be in prayer for our pastor. He is uh, preaching a revival this week at Movella Assembly and uh, just uh, outside of Loosedale. Uh, that's where Brother Wesley goes to church, a great church, a great pastor. Uh, but they need revival just like Bible Way needs revival. And so uh, we're going to be praying for them this week that the Lord will pour out His Spirit upon them and uh, use our, our pastor. Uh, I've told everybody uh, the last little bit, uh, we were, Brother Nettie and I preached uh, up at Sister Helen's back during the summer. Uh, uh, he preached more than I did, but was part of a, three-week revival and something happened in that revival and uh, God just Brother Eddie got a hold of the live wire and uh, just since then God has uh, been using him mightily and uh, he shared with me yesterday he said my phone is ringing off the hook every day he said people calling saying I, God laid you on my heart for revival I need you to come and uh, he's having to turn them away. I can't. I, there, I can't be there. Uh, but uh, I, I'm thankful that I attend a church and sit under a pastor that other churches actually want to hear. I mean, that's a blessing. I mean, there's a lot of them out there that uh, nobody wants to hear what they've got to say. Uh, but uh, thank God for a man that has heard from heaven, hears from heaven. And, uh, and God is using him mightily. So we're going to pray with him and for him that God would just pour out his spirit upon him this week. God would continue to talk to him, talk through him, and use him mightily for the kingdom. Uh, Movella is, what, about an hour and a half uh, from here. So it is within driving range. If you'd like to go, we can get you the directions. I'm going to try my best to get over there at least one night this week uh, to be in revival with them. Uh, so if you'd like to go uh, see me after church and I can get you the directions, but I know that you would be blessed. Brother Allen is no stranger to us at Bible Way. Brother Allen Hinton, phenomenal man of God. And uh, I know that he would uh, love to see you with him this week in revival. Hebrews chapter number 10, we're going to read one verse, verse number 35. Hebrews 10, verse number 35, and it reads as this, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of your reward. I want to preach if the Lord will help me for a few minutes on this thought tonight. Don't lose your confidence. Don't lose your confidence for us, confidence means one thing. But when we see this verse and the, the light in which it was written, and I, we can leave here and, and see it in a different light tonight. And uh, just want to preach out of my heart. Don't lose your confidence. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the word of God. May you add your blessing to the reading of the word. Anoint us now as we endeavor to do your will and your way. Anoint us, God, to say every word you would have me say. God, give me wisdom and discernment to not say one word more. God, I pray that you would use us mightily. God, I pray that you would anoint us to preach, but you would anoint us to respond to the word of God tonight. And Father, I, I pray, move in this altar tonight. Remove every hindrance, remove every obstacle. I rebuke every foul and every unclean spirit of hell that would come against us, that would stop us from reaching to the lofty heights of the portals of glory tonight and getting a hold of you. Father, I pray that you would have your will and your way and we're going to give you the praise, honor, and glory for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. 
If you know, the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the Greeks used a lot of word pictures and uh, different descriptions to, to use the words. And so in the English, we may use a word and it have a, a meaning that we all know it as. In the Greek, they may have five or seven different word pictures associated with that word. And you begin to dig and you begin to study all the, the different meanings of, uh, of, of words and if, uh, it can take on a life of its own. It can take on a, a total different context or meaning based upon the word. And uh, a while back the Lord led me through this verse as I was reading through the Bible and I began to study this word confidence. And for us, uh, the, the word uh, means to, to, to be confident, to, to have confidence in yourself, to, to be strong, to, to uh, not be weary, but to, to be confident, to carry yourself as one who is courageous. And the, the first meaning of the word confident in the Greek is to be bold. It is very similar in nature to that. And so the writer was writing to the church and he told them to cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Don't cast away your boldness. Know who you are in Christ. And don't let anything or anybody cause you to lose confidence in who you are in Him. Don't cast it away. It means hold fast to your boldness, referring to a confident hope in God. The writer admonished them not to cast this away and to become timid and disheartened and discouraged but they were to bear up manfully under their trials and to maintain a steadfast adherence to God and to His cause. Notice the command in Scripture. It doesn't say don't lose your confidence. But it says to cast not away your confidence. You see, the only way that you can lose confidence, which is boldness, which is a gift of a, a, a byproduct of the Spirit of God when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, the holy boldness came upon them to empower them to do the will and the work of God. So boldness is a byproduct of a, a, a Spirit-filled life that comes from, from God Almighty, that comes from the throne room of God. The only way that you can lose that is to surrender it. The only way that you can lose it is to cast it away and to cast it aside and to discard it. Amen. So that's what the writer says. To not cast it away. Don't surrender it. Don't cast it aside. The only way that we lose boldness is if we surrender it. The only way that we lose the Spirit and the gift of God Almighty is if we give it away. So the writer said, no matter what happens in your life, don't cede your confidence. Don't give away your boldness. Don't give away your position, the gifts that Christ has given. But whatever it takes, hold fast. Be confident. Hold fast to the confidence that Christ has given unto us as we look at confidence and what is applicable to us today we're going to go in a different direction in just a minute but as we park out right here for a moment there are three things that you and I must have confidence in that no matter what we face no matter what we go no matter what trial or adversity comes our way amen we must have confidence in some things number one we must have confidence and who God is. Amen. Who God is. For the Bible tells us in Revelation 1 verse 8 that He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the ending which was and which is to come. In Revelation 19 and 6 John was writing and said and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many water and as the voice of many thundering saying Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. John speaks here to the character and the strength of God when he called him the omnipotent one, which means one who has all power. Hallelujah. 
One who holds all power. One who is sovereign. One who is the ruler of all. The all mighty God. That's who we're serving. That's who is our Lord. That's who we're following. Not some fly by night playboy that rises to power one day and loses it the next. Not some power or ruler that stabs adversaries in the back to gain power just to have it done to him days, weeks, or months later. No. But you and I, amen, we have a God, the one true God who never has lost power and never will lose power. Though kings rise and kings fall, oh, hallelujah, our king lives forever. Before Abraham was, he was the great I am. Amen. And today in present world, he still is the I am that I am. Oh, hallelujah. He is the one true living God. And we must not let the adversary blind our eyes to who we're following to make us think that he's less than what he is. To put him in a box that causes us to think that he's not able, amen, to reign and rule and to move on our behalf. But we serve, hallelujah, the one true God when time, amen, before time was he was on his throne and when time expires and we're living in, in all of eternity he still will have all power in his hands we must be confident in whose we are tonight I've used the analogy many times for you to close your eyes and what is it that you see you see blackness. You see emptiness. You see darkness. You see nothing. You see before God spoke the words and created this world, that's what this world was. It was nothing. But God spoke into nothing and made everything that is. He spoke into nothing and made everything that it is. So if God did that in creation, don't you think that he's able to speak in the nothing of our lives and make something marvelous out of it? Oh, hallelujah. He can speak into the empty possibility that is your life. He can speak into the drug addict from adult and teen challenge. Amen. And make a man or woman of God out of them. He can reach to the hog pit of sin. Amen. And reach where the lost is. Speak into their life. Change course. And make a man or a woman of God out of them. I'm talking to you about a God that we should have confidence in. That if He can speak into nothing and make everything, that He can speak into our lives. No matter what we're facing today, nothing is greater than His Word. Nothing is greater than Him. Nothing is too big or too hard for Him. No matter what we face, we must have confidence, folks, in who God is. And we shouldn't let anything cause us to lose that confidence. We must not only be confident in who God is, but we must be confident in what God says. If God says it, you better believe it's going to come to pass. I've used the words of Brother Kenny Moore several times when he said, if God promises you the moon, you better clear off a spot in the backyard to put it. Because if God promises it, it will come to pass. And when God speaks it, you can have confidence and be assured, amen, that he will do exactly what he says. How can we have that confidence? Because Psalms 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Meaning it's done. It's settled. There's no reason to debate it. There's no reason to argue about it. There's no reason. 
Amen. To wonder in our mind if God really says what He meant and meant what He says. When God speaks a word, it's settled. It's done. Hallelujah. It's going to come to pass exactly like He says. Matthew 24 and 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Oh, hallelujah. When the Constitution of the United States is burned up with fire and our government turns into anarchy and it is no more. I can tell you the Constitution in heaven is never going to pass away. You may ask yourself, what is the Constitution? It is the Word of God that's everlasting to everlasting. Amen. That's never going to go out of style. That's never going to lose power. The Word of God Christ Jesus shall never pass away. Matthew 5 verse 18, for verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass. One job or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall not he make it good? We must not only be confident in who God is, but we must be confident, confident in what God says. Don't cast it away. Don't lose confidence. Don't doubt. Don't wonder. But let it be just as settled as it is in heaven. Let it be just as settled in our hearts and our souls and in our minds as it is in the throne room of heaven tonight. Amen. If God said it, He will bring it to pass. You can be confident in that thing tonight. I can't be confident in what Joe Biden says. Amen. We are in trouble if we try to gain confidence in what he says. I don't even know that he believes what he says. I don't even know if he knows what he's saying. Dear God, if the teleprompter breaks, he'll go mute overnight. He's a puppet on the string. I have no confidence in that. I have no confidence in the Republicans or the Democrats. I have no confidence in independents. If they're up there, they need to come home. I have no confidence in our economy. I have no confidence in the track that they're taking us. Oh, but I can tell you tonight, I have confidence in the Lord. I have confidence in His Word. I have confidence in who He is and what He has come to do in our hearts and in our life. I don't have have to be afraid and be fearful and shaken in my boots wondering what's going to happen to the world. Amen. It's a kid's song but it holds true. He holds the whole world in his hands. And if the world is in his hands, then I'm in his hands. And if I'm in his hands, that's the safest place that I can be. And it is the place where we can be most confident. Must be confident in who God is. Must be confident in what He says. And we must have the confidence that He is able to meet us where we are. You see, Islam, they have false confidence in Allah. It's amazing to me how you can pray five times to a God that never answers one prayer. That, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I don't have the highest IQ. But if I were to pray to a God that never answers, I think questions would start popping up in my mind somewhere. What's going on? Why am he answering? And then but billions follow a false God whether it be Allah, Buddha, Joseph Smith, Confucius, Harry Krishna, some other being, pray to a God that never answers. They can't have any confidence in that. But you and I, we have confidence. Number one, we can have confidence because of what he has done in the past. Time would prevent me from naming off to you 
miracles that these eyes have seen. Hey Amen. I, I don't have time to tell you all the things that God has done. But one thing that I know, what I have I've seen yesterday causes me to have confidence for today. And what God is doing today causes me to have confidence for tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold, but I do know who holds tomorrow. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that, which I commit unto his hand even against that day. I'm preaching to you tonight about confidence. I'm preaching to you being confident that he is able, no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, it may be above our head. It may be a troubled relationship that God needs to mend. It may be a physical matter in our body uh, that has doctors scratching their head. Uh, it may be a financial problem that no matter how uh, much we try uh, and how far we dig, we just dig a deeper hole from ourselves uh, and it feels like we're never going to get ahead. Uh, I don't know uh, what the problem may be, uh, but I do know that tonight uh, for the Bible Way Assembly of God, I am confident uh, that God is able to meet us uh, right where we are. Uh, that what may be over our head it is still under our feet and I am persuaded I am confident that my God is able to supply all of our needs according to his riches and his glory by Christ Jesus I am confident in that fact confident in who he is confident that he is able to do it. First John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. But I love verse 14. This is the confidence. I'm going to say that again. This is the confidence that we have in him. Not in any other God. Not in ourself. Not in our financial standing. Not in our credit score. Not in our doctor's report. But this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, the Word of God tells us that He hears us. I'm preaching to you Bible tonight. I'm preaching to you straight gospel. This is the confidence we have in him if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And verse 15 says, and if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. Right. That'll make a mummy want to shout right there. That'll make a Presbyterian want to run a lap around the building. This is the confidence that we have in Him. Amen. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if He hears us, uh, we can have, uh, amen, what we desire uh, from Him. He is able to meet us uh, right where we are. Uh, Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, uh, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, uh, neither his ear heavy uh, that he cannot hear. Uh, but we have the assurance in our heart tonight uh, that when we pray, uh, we pray to a God that hears us. Uh, and if He hears us, uh, we have a God whose arm is able to reach down unto, him, unto us and meet us right where we are. We can be confident in that fact. Why? Because He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All of my answered prayers yesterday causes me to have faith and believe today and be confident that our God hears and our God still answers prayers. There's some of you that are facing situations in your life that the fact of the matter is if God doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. There's situations in my life that if God doesn't do it, it's not going to be done. But isn't that the place where God wants us to be? Isn't that the place where we need to abide and we need to live with full faith and assurance, confidence in Him. Paul teaches us this. In Acts 27, one of my favorite stories, 
You know, Paul was in the middle of that Eurachlodon. And the Bible says that in verse number 17 that they had taken up the ship. They had used helps undergirding the ship. Fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sails, and so were driven. They were still exceedingly tossed with a tempest, and the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Notice in the first portion of the storm that they had confidence in themselves. They were the architect of what they thought would be good solutions. They said we'll undergird the ship, which means they would tie ropes around the ship to help hold it together. They threw the tackling off the ship and then on the third day they cast all the weight, all the, 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 the cargo, all of the, the baggage off of the ship. You see, at this point, they were confident in their ability to help right the ship, to help navigate it through the storm. At this point, they had confidence in themselves. But the storm got so bad that in verse 20, it said, when neither sun nor stars and many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, that all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. What happened in that verse? They lost confidence in themselves because they realized for three days, Brother Daniel, they did everything that they could to fix that problem. If it had come to their mind and sounded like a good solution, they did it. But it came to the point where that storm rocked on long enough. They said, everything we've done has not fixed the problem. You see, they lost confidence in themselves. But in verse number 21, after long abstinence, the Bible says that Paul stood in the midst of them. <coughs> It says, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not lose from Crete to gain this harm and loss. But now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I am served, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, Lord God, hath given thee all them that sail with thee. And he said in verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told unto me. In the first portion of the storm, they had confidence in themselves. In the second portion, they lost confidence in themselves. But Paul missed, or, 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 or redirected their confidence and said, Sirs, amen, I'm confident in one thing, that there is a God, that I'm His, that we're in His hand, hallelujah, and that He has spoken unto me. You see, he had confidence in the person of His God. He had confidence in the power of His God. He had confidence of His purpose in God and he had confidence in the promise of his God notice the wind didn't stop when God spoke notice the storm did not abate when God spoke amen but Paul had to have confidence in the spoken word of God that even though the wind still blew even though the waves still roared even though the rain still fell his faith and his confidence in God was greater than his fear of the storm and of the waves and when he held on to confidence uh, and when he held on to God uh, God pulled him through uh, you may be in the storm of your life tonight uh, but don't cast away your confidence uh, don't let the storm uh, steal your confidence uh, but be confident in God uh, be confident in his person uh, be confident in his power uh, and be confident uh, in his promise uh, that he will bring us through Be bold and be confident. There's things that we should be confident in. And we shouldn't cast our confidence away. This is the point tonight that God wants us. The place where we lose confidence in ourselves. But we hold on confidently to Him. For Him to bring us through. That's what that word confidence means. The writer of Hebrews says, don't cast away your confidence. Cast away your boldness. Don't cast away 
that. Be strong. Be fierce. Be brave. Be bold. But the second word picture of that word confidence. And as I began studying this this afternoon, I had church right by myself. But there's a an allegory of sorts in this writer that to us, we just read over this, cast not away your confidence. We can take it for value, face value for what it says. But the original writer and the original reader, that word has a whole deeper meaning than what we know it as. That goes deeper than boldness that goes deeper than what we know to be confident in. But one writer, you study this out for yourself, never seen this before, but different commentaries agree that there may be an illusion here to what the, the Greeks would know from warfare. When the writer said, cast not away your confidence, that word confidence was used by many of the Greeks as a reference to their shield in time of war. The, the, the word picture here, would, the same way when it says, cast not away your confidence, would be the same word picture of a warrior going into battle. And when the battle got tough and the battle got hard and he realized that he may not be the winner on the battlefield, he would cast his shield away and he would begin to retreat and to run for a place of safety. You see, shields in these days were not the little circular shield that many people envisioned and what Hollywood has cast shields as, but shields when they would go into battle would be the height from the, the chin down to the toes. It was a big, bulky instrument. And if one was going to retreat in battle, he was not going to be able to retreat with a shield. But if he was going to retreat, he would have to cast the shield away. He would have to throw the shield away and, and begin to, to run. And among the Greeks, this was a crime which was punishable by death. This was considered treason. This was considered the, the, the highest offense against the state that one can make one who is dishonorable, one who retreats while his brother's fault, one who casted away his shield, casted away his confidence. It was said by Spartan mothers to their sons before they went out in battle to remind them of bravery and duty to Sparta and Greeks that one could not escape the battlefield unless he tossed away the heavy and cumbersome shield. Therefore, losing one shield meant desertion. It meant dishonor. It meant disgrace. And this led the Greeks to coin a famous saying, that mothers would tell their sons before they went into battle to either come back with your shield or come back on your shield. Which means either you come back victorious with your shield intact and you walk through the streets honorable as a victor or you come back on your shield as one who died on the battle. But whatever you do, don't come back without your shield. Don't come back without your confidence. Hallelujah. It means come back in victory or come back, amen, on it. No matter what happened, how hot the battle, the warrior was never to discard his shield. And can I tell you tonight, no matter how hot the trial, 
How hard the temptation, how fierce the battle, how hot the fire, how tough the warfare. We as the church should not throw away our shield. We should not cast away our confidence. Amen. But we should hold fast. Amen. We should keep fighting. Amen. We must keep on the firing line. Oh, you must fight. Be brave against all evil. Never run, nor even lag behind. If you would win for God and the right, keep on the firing line. Keep your confidence. Keep your shield. Keep your face toward the battle. Don't cast it aside. Don't run away in dishonor, but hold fast. Fight the good fight of faith. Come back victorious with your shield. To throw away one's confidence in God was just as big of a disgrace as a fighter that deserted in battle. One to cast away their confidence in God is just as treasonous as a fighter that would throw down his sword, his shield, his rifle, and run away. Amen. We should not lose our confidence. Besides its primary function as a protective device, the shield also had symbolic meaning. A Spartan mother had warned her son to either return with your shield or own it. For those shields, when they went into battle, one side would be strong enough to endure hardness, to be able to be a defensive weapon that would shield against the cuts of the sword or the arrows that would fly or the spears that would be jabbed in them. That would be the shield. But for those that died in battle, the shield was big enough to be a stretcher or a buyer that they would place the dead on. And as they would bring them back into the city for a burial, they would carry them back in on the shield. The shield had two purposes. It was often decorative to where it would not only have the coat of arms possibly of their country, but it oftentimes was a family crest and seal that would accompany that soldier to the graveyard. And that soldier would oftentimes, Brother David, be buried with his shield. That shield would never depart from a warrior that was faithful in battle. Amen. This is exactly how we should live our lives. To where we may die in the battle. But Brother Daniel, we should never give up our shield. We should never give up our confidence. You look at those three Hebrew boys facing Nebuchadnezzar's fire, facing what was sure to be uh, 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 instant death uh, as they were to be thrown in. Nebuchadnezzar said, boys, uh, I'm going to give you one more shot. Uh, amen. I, I, I've heated up this fire seven times hotter. Uh, amen. But I, I'm going to give you another shot. Uh, I don't want you to die today. Uh, amen. You bow down and you worship my image uh, and you're going to live. Uh, amen. He gave them another opportunity, but I love uh, their response. Uh, they said, oh, king, uh, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not... But if not, be it known, O king, we refuse to bow. Amen. They had a mentality about them. They're not going to cast away their confidence in God. They're not going to cast away their shield and be deserters. They said, we know our God is able to deliver us from the fire and from your hand. But if not, if this is the day we die, if this is the day, amen, our last breaths are drawn, we're standing fast with our confidence. We're standing fast with our shield. We're not going to cast it away or cast it aside. We believe God that He is able, but if not, we're not going to lose our confidence. What about Job? 
in Job 23 when he said, I've looked all around, Brother Daniel. I can't see God. I can't see him in my circumstances. I've, I've prayed and it's like he doesn't hear me. Amen. I've, I, I behold, I go forward and he's not there and backward. I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on my right hand that I cannot see him. Have you ever been there? Where you ask the question, God, where are you at? I can't feel you. I can't see you. I feel like I'm walking this road all alone. A lot of people lose confidence in the crucible of their life. They lose confidence. But I can tell you Job didn't. He said, I've looked for him. I go forward. He's not there. Backward, he's not there. I look at him on the left hand. It's, I can't seem to find him. I look at him on my right hand and he's hiding. But he said in verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he had tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Job said, even though I can't see him, I'm not going to lose confidence in him. Hallelujah. I don't know whether to preach or whether to run. Even though I can't feel him, I'm not going to lose confidence. Even though my prayers may bounce off the ceiling back to my face, I'm not going to throw away my shield. I'm not going to be a deserter in the battle of life. But I'm going to have confidence. He's going to bring me through. And if not, and this is the end, I'm going to wake up in glory and be with him forever. Though Job lost his children, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, he never lost his confidence. He never lost his shield. And because of that, God brought him through and God gave him double for his trouble. Is that a promise for every man? No. I'm not here preaching to you some prosperity mumbo jumbo. Name it, claim it, blab and grab it. But I am telling you if you'll hold fast for your confidence, he may not give you double for your trouble, but he will give a view of himself. And when you have him, honey, that's all that you need. Amen. That's not going to come to those that throw away the sheep is going to come to, to those uh, that hold fast to confidence uh, despite what they see uh, despite what they hear uh, and despite what the enemy wants them to know Amen. Job went on to say though he may slay me yet will I trust him I don't know whether I'm going to carry the, sh the, the shield whether I'm going to be carried back on my shield. But I'm not letting go of it. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not losing confidence. These men said I may die in the fight. But I'm not going to die. I'm not going to go out without my shield. I'm going down with the confidence. That God is able. A Spartan king. Demeritos. He was asked why it was dishonorable to return with a shield and not without a helmet. And he replied, because the ladder they put on for their own protection. He said, but when they carry that shield, they carry the shield for common good and for the betterment of all. That shield united them with our brothers in arms. And it united them with a cause that was greater than themselves. When they would carry their shield into battle, they were reminded that they weren't just fighting for themselves, but they were fighting for all of those around them. Listen, when we fight the good fight of faith, we're fighting for a God that's bigger than us. We're fighting for a cause that's higher than us. And we're fighting for, for others that we love more than we love ourselves. You see, the shield unites us. The United States of America, different branches of service have their own uniform, but they're all united by that flag on their shoulder. 
And it's that flag that unites them. Whether your Air Force, whether your Marines, whether your Army, or whether your Navy, or whether your Space Force, Merchant Marines, the Coast Guard, amen, they may have different jobs, may have different functions, may have different uniforms, but they're all unified by the flag. That flag reminds them that they're fighting for liberty and justice for all. They're fighting for a cause that's greater than themselves. They're fighting for something that's a bigger moral, amen, obligation than their own comfort, than their own ease, than their own protection. Amen. I can tell you folks the same way that it is in the United States Armed Forces. It's that way in the Army of the Lord Jesus Christ. We may have different functions. We may have different callings. We may have different roles. But we're all united by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that cross is a cause that's higher than me. It's an obligation. Amen. That's greater. Amen. Than anything that I can commandeer on my own. It's a love that's greater than anything that I have ever known. We must not cast away the confidence. We must not tear throw away our shield. But we should go onward. Christian soldier fighting for the cause. That's why Paul wrote unto Timothy. Told him endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who would chosen him to be a soldier. I can tell you of a surety, you cast away your shield, you cast away your confidence, you will not please God. But I can tell you if you'll hold fast, fight the good fight of faith, don't desert, don't run, don't cast away your confidence. There is coming a day soon and very soon when you'll hear the words, well done. Thou good. Thou good and thy faithful servant. I've got to hurry to a close. In Ephesians chapter number 6, you know these portions of Scripture is the whole armor of God. But notice what the writer said in verse number 16. He's already talked and described the sword. He's already described the helmet of salvation. He's already talked about the loins that's girded about with truth. He's already talked about the, the shoes, the breastplate of righteousness. But he says in verse number 16, above all. You may not have a sword. You may not have a breastplate. You may not have a helmet. But above all, Take hold of the shield. Right. Oh, it brings it all into light, folks. That shield represents our confidence in God. That shield represents a cause that's higher than ourselves, that unites us with brothers and sisters on the front lines. Above all, taking the shield of faith whereby you may quench the fiery darts of the wicked, the fiery darts of the devil. I looked up that phrase, the fiery darts. And I can tell you that they did not have a Geneva Convention in these days that limited the, the acts of warfare. They were brutal, they were barbaric, and it was life or death. There were two things that they would do. For us, we just read that if you have the, the shield of faith, you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the, the wicked. What are the fiery darts? They had like a turpentine or a tar. Oftentimes that they would affix to those arrows. And they would put something on there that was flammable and they would take that bow and arrow and they would literally launch arrows of fire on the battlefield. And if they didn't have that shield, the death and mortality rate would be very high. But if they had a shield, at least they had a fighting chance. But here's what, what got me. There was another use for those arrows and those rods that they would use, the shafts, to, uh, to, to affix to a bow and shoot them. 
I don't know how that they would do this. It would require a lot of venom and a lot of snakes. And in the words of Daniel Rada, I would be out on that right there. But these people were so barbaric that they would drain the venom from these snakes. And they would literally marinate their bows and arrows in the venom of the asp. They would soak it in them. And when they would attach that bow and arrow, or attach the arrow to the bow, and they would shoot them, those arrows and the tips of uh, th those weapons would have as much venom as a rattlesnake bite on them. And when it would pierce through the flesh, they said that it would burn like fire. And it would be with just a couple of hours, the venom that were in those arrows, it would cause them to, to speed up the death process and they would die much quicker. Barbaric, I can tell you, is how they would fight in battlefields of, on those days. If a man went into the battle with no shield, commentaries say he was just as good as dead. If the sword and the spear didn't get him, the fiery darts of the wicked, the fiery darts of that adversary, whether it be flaming fires or whether it be the venom of the rattlesnake, the venom of the snake, if he didn't have a shield, he might as well sign his death certificate because that would be carrying him back home if he made it off the battlefield. That's why the writer says, above all, take the shield of faith. Well, thereby you may quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Brother Daniel, don't cast the shield away. Brother Bob, don't cast the shield away. If we cast it away and cast it aside, we might as well sign our own death certificate because we are going to be a casualty in this warfare of the faith. And we will succumb on the battlefield if we don't desert and run the other way. Amen. But hold fast to the shield. Hold fast to the confidence uh, the same way those Greeks in battle uh, would hold fast to the shield. You and I uh, have been given the charge uh, to hold fast to it. Uh, amen. If he had a shield, uh, he had confidence going in battle uh, that at least I have a shot to make it through. Uh, I can tell you if we'll hold fast to the shield of faith, uh, we got a lot better uh, than a puncher's chance. Uh, we've got God uh, on our side. Uh, oh, and if God for us, then who can be against us? I am more than a conqueror if I don't cast away my confidence, but if I hold fast to it, hold fast to the shield, we are promised victory. What happens to those that cast away their confidence? They will be a casualty. In this warfare. But the Bible tells us in verse number 34. For those that hold on to it. For those that don't lose their confidence. For those that don't lose their shield. The Bible tells us. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Which hath great recompense of reward. For verse 36 says. For you have need of patience that after that you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and not tarry. You see, there were four promises. Kirsten, if you'll help me, I'm done. To those that would cast not away their confidence. Number one, Christ is the reward for all those that hold fast to the shield. For all those that hold fast to the confidence, there is a reward that's coming. When we get to see Him as He is, and when instantaneously we're made like Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That is the reward for the faithful. 
That is the reward for those that don't lose confidence. What greater reward is there than Christ? Amen. Amen. After that, you've done the will of God. You might receive the promise. Not a promise, but the promise. Christ is the promise for all those that fight the good fight of faith and don't turn back into desertion. Number two, the rapture is the reward. Amen. For those that keep fighting, there is going to come a day we sung about it tonight when we're going to fly away home. Amen. For soldiers that fight in the army after they fought so long, they get a leave to wear for 72 hours, 96 hours, whatever the case may be. They get a leave to where they get a little R&R. &R. Amen. We may not get that in the Christian journey, but there is going to be a day when we get enough points. Amen. When we've been in the battle long enough. Amen. The Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ are going to rise up first and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up with them. The rapture is the reward for the faithful don't lose heart God is not slack concerning his promise but he's long suffering and not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance but there is coming a day when those clouds are going to split the rapture is going to take place and the church will go home you may ask what do I have to do, preacher, to be in that number? You got to be born again. You got to be blood bought. You got to have your confidence. You got to have your shield. Amen. To them that are looking for him, shall he appear the second time without seeing unto salvation? Third, heaven is the reward for the believer. Streets of gold, walls of jasper. Gates of pearl, the foundations of presence of precious stones. Heaven is a reward for those that don't lose confidence. Eternal life is the reward. You can rest assured of two things. Number one, man's days are full of few in number full of trouble but number two there remaineth the rest for the child of God we might have to endure some long days some long nights for the meat that's, that's full of trouble but if we we'll hold our confidence if we we'll hold fast to the shield there remains a rest for the child of God. I'm preaching to somebody tonight that's in a trial maybe of your life. And all of hell is telling you just quit. It's never going to get any better. It's always going to be this way. Just throw away your confidence. Throw away the shield. The man cast away his shield in battle. He was either a deserter, a traitor, or a dead man. You want to know what the devil wants out of your life? He wants to make you a deserter. He wants to make you a traitor. And then he wants to make you a dead man. That's what he wants. And so if he's coming at you in your ear telling you all of that, if he's trying to make you quit, then you know you've got something worth fighting for. So God this afternoon spoke to my heart so strong said you tell them don't cast away your confidence don't throw away your confidence don't throw away your boldness don't lose sight of who God is of what he can do of what he has done don't lose sight of all that hold fast hold firm but also those that are in a battle that confidence is your shield don't cast away the shield <coughs> Hey man, I don't know what you're facing, what you're going through. I don't need to know. But I can tell you the Holy Ghost is here on a Sunday night to meet you right where you are. To give you strength for the battle. To give you strength for the journey. To tighten your grip on the shield.
You may be weary. You're, you may be getting frail. You may be getting weak. But the Bible says, Be not weary in well doing, for you'll reap a new season if you faint not. If you don't let go of your shield, if you don't cast away the confidence, victory is promised for the child of God. When's it coming? I don't know. It's not for me to know. Brother Ray, Brother Ray, but it is for me to keep fighting and to keep holding fast in confidence with my shield. How many of you will meet me in this altar tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. I have felt God in this house as much tonight as I've ever felt. And we not, may not be shouting and running the aisles and pews. But I believe tonight could be the matter of life and death for somebody. I believe tonight could be a decision point where spiritually you'll walk out and you'll leave the shield behind. Or either you're going to make up in your mind, come hell or high water, I'm not let go. I'm telling you folks, I feel it in my heart. There's a warfare in your mind right now. And the devil's already told you it'd be easier to quit. It'd be easier to run, easier to desert. But God's here telling you by His Word, hold fast. Help's coming. Victory's on the way. Shabbat Abba Kushatana Bayay.